The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Please join me in the call to worship. So much in life is unpredictable. Life begins and ends. The weather changes. Love surprises us. Doors close, others open. Life is unpredictable, but what we can count on is finding God in this space, for this is God's space and all are welcome. So bring your questions and concerns, your doubts and wonderings, for in the midst of this unpredictable life, we can predict this. Love lives here, let us worship God. Please join me in the opening prayer. Let us pray. God of life, be present to us this day in ways that defy understanding, drawing us into the mystery of your presence within and around us. Like tender leaves, uncoil our hearts to the warmth of your love, that we may join you in recreating our world in this time of transition. Amen. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us in order that we might live. Because we have faith in Christ, we dare to approach God with the truth of our lives. Please join me in the litany of confession. Gracious God, 
You asked us to follow you and we respond with logistical questions. How long? Where to? Will we, will we return? You ask us to love each other and we respond with excuses. I don't know how. We don't see eye to eye. You ask us to dream and we get stuck in our own heads. Change will never come. Is it worth it? You ask us to believe and like Thomas, we ask for proof. Unless I see the nails in his hands, I cannot believe. Forgive us for our small-minded ways. Open our eyes as you open our hearts. Unravel our doubt. Unravel our own unbelief. Lead us to rest in you. Gratefully we pray, amen. In the silence of this time together, we bring to you all that needs mending, healing, and help. God, we come to you asking for forgiveness, asking for proof that your grace is enough each day. And now we look for that proof in the remembrance of our baptism. Listen now to the sound of your baptism. Just like the water cleanses us, the grace of God frees us to live into the truth that we are made whole and that we are loved. Thanks be to God. Amen. All right, and now it is time for our raucous passing of the peace, where we share the peace of Christ with one another from wherever we find ourselves worshiping this morning. 
So I will say the peace of Christ be with you and I share the peace. Peace, 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 Hi, David. Was on for eight years. <laughs> I just thought we were an actual fuzzy. I see Jim Cox with a beard. <laughs> Hello again, everybody. I always love hearing all your voices from afar. That was so fun. I wanted to say welcome to Worship at Brown Memorial. My name is Michelle, and I am delighted that you are here this morning with us on Zoom. If you are visiting with us today, we encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat window so we can all say welcome. As you have no doubt seen, we have muted everyone for most of worship and we will unmute you or give you the power to unmute yourself at different points. We will also invite prayers later in the service in the chat window for the prayers of the people. Today, we will be having a green team courtyard presentation to go over the designs and dreams of the courtyard garden renovation that members of the green team have been working on since October. Some of you attended a Sunday school class where we did some sketches of the courtyard and what we hoped it could be used for, for our community. So if you would like to see what those sketches have resulted in, please join us for the courtyard time. And you can just stay on the link for worship and not need to leave. Um, we also will have a Families of Faith parent gathering tonight at 8.30. Lindsay Taylor and Rachel Cunningham have the Zoom link for that, so you can reach out to one of them to have access to that as well. And we wanted to give you an update too to let you know that as we have shifted into this current reality, we are beginning to identify a number of ways that members of our community can get involved in outreach, support of those in the healthcare industry and those on the margins. So this week, look for a more detailed communication from the church about ways that you might get involved and if you have some time on your hands and you'd like to help lead one of those efforts, please let any member of the staff know or let your elder or deacon who has reached out to you in the last couple of weeks know that too. This week, we have Theology on Tap with um, political theologian Annie Masaros, who will be discussing spiritual darkness in the time of COVID-19. You can find the Zoom link for that on the church calendar. And that will be at the regular time at 7.30 p.m. 
Wednesday morning Bible study will take place at 1030, like normal. And if you'd like information on that gathering, please go to the calendar and find the link on the church website. There will also be a Wednesday Zoom gathering for children with Miss Rachel and Miss Amy at 4 p.m. You can contact Rachel for that link. We'll also have midweek Thursday prayer service at 5.30 p.m. And the Faith and Literature group will be back this month on Friday at 7. This month, they'll be discussing reflections on the pandemic. And you can um, offer personal observations or any variety of responses found in print or media sources that have inspired or touched or challenged you during the season. And you can find the link again on the calendar. And like always, you can find us here on Zoom. So we'll be back here next Sunday and you can join us like always for adult and youth education hours at 945 as well. So now I'd like to invite the children and whatever puppet or stuffed animal friends they have to please come forward to your screens to meet with Pastor Andrew. It's great to see everyone today. Oh, hi, Isabel. Hi. I, uh, I see that you're wearing your your face mask, you look like you're preparing to go outside. Yes, I just can't stand it any longer. I'm going to church. Well, but Isabel, the, the, the church is, is meeting on Zoom, Zoom right now. No, I'm going to the real church with the stained glass windows and all the people. Oh, oh, but, but Isabel, no one is in the church building except for Michael. We want to keep everyone safe. So that's why we've been meeting on Zoom. But I have to go to church. I need to be closer to God. Well, I, I hear you, Isabel. I, I think a lot of us feel closer to God in the church building. But you know, the truth is, God isn't really any more there than here. Really? Well, why did they go to all the trouble to build it then? <laughs> well, I think we build church buildings as a way of saying that it's really important to create spaces in our lives where we honor God and love God and that we want the space where we gather to reflect our deep love of God. But God doesn't only meet us there. I mean, there's a story today from the Bible about the disciples and they were locked in their room two Sundays in a row and Jesus comes and appears to them behind those locked doors. <gasps> How did he get through the locked door? Well, I have no idea, <laughs> but I love to imagine that God can come to us wherever we are, even if we are stuck at home. God can come and find us, especially when we need God in our lives. I feel so much better. <laughs> I'm so glad. Well, let's pray together and let's pray with all of our friends at home. And this will be a repeat after me prayer. Loving God. Loving God. Thank you for coming to find us. Thank you for coming to find us. And thank you for your love that always finds us. Thank you for your love that always finds us. Amen. Amen. It's good to see all the friends at home. Let us pray. Mother of all wisdom and father of surprise, your thoughts are not our thoughts, nor are your ways our ways. Where we are closed, open us with your word that we might recognize Christ and follow. Amen. The New Testament reading comes from the epistle 1 Peter. Listen now for the word of God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, 
so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. The Gospel reading comes from the book of John. Listen now for a word from God this day. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the religious authorities, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, for if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. 
My Lord and my God. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet to come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks, Thanks be to God. If you can hear me, please give me a thumbs up. All right. Please pray with me. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I know it's a mistake to read every text through the lens of COVID-19, but this one made that approach especially difficult. Last week, Jesus was the perfect poster child for the public health campaign. Do not hold on to me, he told Mary Magdalene, who was not doing a very good job keeping her social distance. But public health Jesus falls apart this week. He enters someone else's house, not permitted, and breathes on the disciples. Then he comes back the following week and has everybody sticking their dirty hands in his open wounds. Everything in me just wants to scream, coronavirus, coronavirus. But public health problems aside, it's comforting to see that one week after Easter, the disciples are stuck like us, behind closed doors, wondering like us if Easter made any difference. A week later, the text says Jesus' disciples were again in the house. It's Groundhog's Day for them all over again. The only thing different for them from last week is that Thomas, who was absent when the resurrected Christ first made an appearance, is now with them. He had been absent last week on Easter when the disciples were in the same place behind locked doors for fear of the authorities. The text actually says for fear of the Jews, but now many of us know that fear of the Jews is the author's community talking. Historically, this phrase wouldn't make any sense since all of the people locked behind the doors were also Jews. The fear of those Easter evening disciples must have been fear that what happened to Jesus at the hands of the state could happen to them too. It's important to remember that fear before we start talking about Thomas and his doubt. Those early disciples weren't having purely intellectual conversations from the comfort of their armchairs. Do you believe or not believe that Jesus was this or that from a safe philosophical distance? No, following Jesus, believing in his authority and his way came with potential costs, suffering and possibly death. Belief wasn't casual, it was life or death. Thomas seemed to catch on to this early on in his time with Jesus. He only speaks three times in the New Testament, all three times in John's gospel. The first is on the way to the tomb of Lazarus. Jesus, speaking of the death of his friend, says, For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. And Thomas retorts, Let us also go that we may die with him. Death has been on Thomas's mind early on, and he seems skeptical that the Jesus way is going to win. The second time is again in reference to that line between life and death at the Last Supper. Do not let your hearts be troubled, Jesus tells his very troubled disciples. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you 
maybe also, and you know the way to the place where I am going. But Thomas, as the kid who asks the questions that everybody else wants to know but is afraid to ask, says, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? I've heard it suggested that Thomas's problem is that he doesn't believe Mary Magdalene. She is the first witness to the resurrected Christ and the first preacher proclaiming resurrection hope. But by the time Thomas says, unless I see Jesus for myself, I won't believe, every one of the disciples is testifying to the risen Christ. I think Thomas's problem is not really a problem to most of us. It's a virtue to most of us. We have learned to question the way subjective experience is sometimes presented as objective fact. We've learned that kind of skepticism for very good reason. It's so obvious during this coronavirus pandemic that we barely even have to name it. We can all see the way a rumor that people of color can't catch the coronavirus can put people of color more at risk on top of the structural racism that already leaves people of color as a whole more vulnerable to the virus. We can all see the way neglecting data early on left our nation and others ill prepared for the reality that has come. And as our fossil fueled economy rests, we all see the way climate change denials have left the planet in some hot water that we'll be dealing with for generations to come. We have learned how to be skeptical of claims to truth that aren't backed up by data to support it. Few of us would want to criticize Thomas for that. We want to commend him for it. And yet, Thomas's seeing as believing approach doesn't necessarily lead him to the whole truth. There are some truths that cannot be seen in the conventional sense. Cyrus Habib knows this. The young lieutenant governor of the state of Washington trekked up Mount Kilimanjaro last year to fulfill a lifelong dream. He made it to the top, which would impress some people since Habib has been blind since the age of eight. But the impressive part to me was actually Habib's description of what he experienced. You feel it, he told Frank Bruni of the New York Times. You feel the whole world dropping away. I have a sense, he said, of spatiality based on acoustics and maybe even other types of senses that I can't scientifically describe. I can feel when I'm in a huge cathedral. I can feel when I'm in a small bedroom. At the top of Kilimanjaro, he said, it felt to me like I was on the moon because of the thinness of the air. You're kind of high, lightheaded, and you feel the sense of vastness that's not just around you, but also below you. You can feel it in your body. It seems there are some things that can't be seen in the conventional sense. And yet individual sight of any kind can be misleading for yet another reason. And that is that we have to use our brains to interpret and weigh what it is that we are seeing. Some would say that is exactly the problem with some of our more inept leaders who trust what they see with their own eyes more than what the data actually tells them. The apparatus that sees the world is over 400 million years old, one social psychologist told a reporter recently. But the prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain that comprehends projection models from the CDC, it is maybe 2.5 million years old. That's brand new in evolutionary terms. It's still in beta testing. And yet this is the very part of the brain that we need the most in addressing the very things that we can't see, such as climate change and viruses that attack the body long before we see its effects. Seeing, it turns out, might lead to belief, but it doesn't necessarily make that belief any more accurate. 
So how are we to differentiate between beliefs that we should only hold when we see with our own individualized ways of seeing and those that we may only see through the testimony of others? John's gospel answered the question by saying the whole purpose of writing this book is so that you can believe what others have seen. You can believe through what others have seen. You can believe that Jesus was the presence of the divine in flesh and blood through the testimony of others. Yet the very existence of this book, created at the time when Jews who believed Jesus was Messiah were banned from the synagogue, also raises questions about this approach. Obviously, many other people did not believe in the testimony of others. Testimony was simply not enough for everyone. It may still not be enough for some of us. Rather than viewing Thomas as a problem to be solved, a doubter that the church should be in the business of converting, I wonder if it's better to think about Thomas as that doubting part of us, which is part of the fabric of our being. As a grieving friend who was also a pastor wrote to me recently, I trust that God is the renewing force in the scientific processes all around us. I also believe weird woo-woo spirit heaven things are real and matter and somehow find me when I am in the midst of a maybe it's all horse crap moment. I have no patience for anyone who is certain about either extreme though. I can handle poets and music and kids and birds. I love the way my friend in testifying to the reality of God's searching presence also acknowledges the possibility that this faith business could all be crap. It's almost like she knows that trying to silence any of those voices, the scientific skeptic or the new agey mystic would not only be unsuccessful, it would somehow rob us of our humanness. That essential curiosity and desire to know truth impossibly weave together with our sense that there is a love that finds our impossibly small selves in the universe. A truth that maybe our infant brains just aren't big enough to behold. The reasonable person says in their head, there is no other life after this, but only the wicked says it in their heart. So said the Spanish philosopher Michael Unamano, describing that essential truth that the very things that we cannot prove rationally may still be the truth that drives our life, that gives us purpose. Since the wicked person is possibly only a person who has been driven to despair, he wrote. Will a human God condemn them because of their despair? Their despair alone is misfortune enough. I'd rather live rationally, yes, trusting with my friend that God is working through the scientific process. Flattening the curve makes sense because Someone discovered that math could describe a reality, and that description of that reality could help us save lives. God gave us brains, and someone used theirs to invent statistics, and others applied it to help us stay safe together. I want leaders who listen to public health data rather than their own two eyes, just as I believe with all my heart that the doctors and nurses in our hospitals who have gone to school to gain wisdom about our bodies are the healers that God has sent to us now. And yet at the very same time, there are some kinds of realities that we don't have understanding, knowledge, or language to describe. Chief among them is the experience of God's visitation, God's presence planted so deep in my soul, the sense of God's love watching over us, yes, but in a personal, particular way. A sustaining love that I do not understand and probably never will. Love that gets to us behind every door that we try to lock for our own self-protection, showing us that 
while we can never erase our wounds, it is possible to live with them. A presence that evokes faith, not in some defensive sense of needing to prove anything to others, but a trust that life is good, that I am enough for the tasks and the life to which God calls me only because God has declared this to be so. I'm in some good company with many of you who have at different points in your life journeys expressed something similar. And also with Cyrus Habib, that young Lieutenant Governor on the rise in Washington state politics stunned many when he announced last month that he wouldn't be running for reelection this November. Instead, he'd be joining the Jesuit priesthood. Habib saw that the celebrity culture of politics is a never ending river that carries people along, whether it's still good for them or not. There's always the next pillar to climb up on. I think this is probably true for most good things in life. That can do, can overcome mentality is fantastic and can get you far, Habib said in the interview. But if hardened into an ideology of its own, it can crowd God out because it makes you into a kind of God and says, I'm not a contingent creature. I am completely independent. He says his decision has nothing to do with the current crisis. But Frank Bruni, who wrote the article, observes that it does reflect the sort of moral inventory that many people conduct at a time of great suffering the type of spiritual epiphany they experience in the face of terrifying uncertainty. The truth that even as something naked to the eye attacks us all, something greater is at work within and beyond us. I know this is a difficult time for many of us, and I know those difficulties are likely to multiply. All the more reason to remember those early disciples behind locked doors, grieving their losses and the shattering of their own world. It is there that God found them. It is there where God gave them a peace in an odd way beyond their understanding. May the wounded love of God find you too. Amen.
We come before God to commit our skeptical hearts. As a symbol of our skepticism and of our belief, we come to offer our full selves. At the times that we doubt, it is hard to see God's love and light. So we ask that God will show us God's goodness in the world and will help us to know God's love through the way we give of ourselves and our time and our skills. And now we ask that God will take these gifts we offer as symbols of our faith and doubt. The offering will be received through the online link in the chat window. You are also welcome to submit a check through the mail. And we ask that you now give of your full self, your faith and your doubt in this time.
Please join me now in the prayer of dedication. We offer ourselves, O oh God, our days, our skills, and our finances, because we trust in your promises, even when they are difficult to believe. We want to believe that God's news is good news and true even when people tell us it is not. And when we encounter doubt, we ask you to strengthen us. We ask you to guide us in your perfect wisdom and counsel. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, there is much sadness in our world. Death of loved ones, loss of jobs and income, loss of the illusion of certainty. Hear us now as we cry out our grief together. Gracious and loving God, in the midst of our grief, grant us patience and give us the strength to endure. Be with all those individuals on the front lines, healthcare workers, essential store employees, and those in the National Guard called into service. Hear us as we collectively ask for your help and guidance in this time of crisis. Thank mm -hmm. you. God, we give you thanks for the beauty of your magnificent creation, which daily brings signs of hope. 
We give thanks for signs of healing, and on this Sunday in particular, we give thanks for Ellen Carter Cooper's return home this week. Even in crisis, there's much to be grateful for. Hear our prayers now of thanksgiving and praise. lift all of these prayers to you in the name of your son Jesus saying the prayer that he taught us our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
indeed, this is the good news of the gospel, that God does not forsake us. Wherever we are, whatever we struggle through, God is with us and God's love finds us. So leave this place trusting in the grace and the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the redemption of Jesus Christ who comes and finds us behind our locked doors. Amen.